promises. And uh, today we're going to be in Exodus chapter 35. We're going to talk a bit about the Sabbath, but I'm going to take a different kind of twist on the Sabbath. Um, there's always great teaching you can do on the Sabbath, and there's a lot of things. We'll talk a little bit about that, uh, its place in the New Testament, how it's viewed by an expert from the New Testament, that is the Apostle Paul. But we'll talk about something a little bit different, which I think it'll be uh, revealing and helpful as we look at scriptures the Old Testament and New Testament about this idea of rest. Uh, uh, thanks so much, guys. Yesterday, I know I had to get out real quick. I'm so sorry about that. The delivery, you know, for my Father's Day gift, which was a uh, a grill, a smoker. Well, it's a pellet grill. I don't know. If it, it, it does smoke, but it's not like a true smoker because I'm not a true smoker guy. Um, they just came a day early and they came so early in the morning, they cut our stuff short. So my apologies for running out yesterday so fast, but today we're going to jump on into the word again and have a great time. So let's go over to Exodus chapter 35. Remember, this is Moses. He's making his second uh, ascension and descension from Mount Sinai as God is giving him instructions on what he wants from his people and how they ought to live. Um, and so Moses comes down, he's got uh, two new tablets, God has uh, given him his word, and he expects that Moses would then transfer what God has told him to the people. And one of the things that we talked about briefly yesterday is that's God's method of delivering his word. He works through people, he works through direct conversation, he works through experiences that they have in adherence to God's word versus rejecting it. Uh, and then he works through imagery, through the different things that he has done. And we see that. And Moses uh, is coming down. And the thing that's powerful here is that God is directing him. But how do you confirm that? Well, you confirm it by the phenomenal uh, miraculous signs and wonders that accompany Moses. These are confirmations as to why the word of God is true and why you can trust it. It's very, very powerful in, in, in that, um, in that light. And so, you know, there are many things to view that way in scripture, which is profound. I mean, when you look in the new Testament, I mean, it's a side note, you know, me, I'm always, always got a side note. <laughs> That's why we don't get through many of them. When you look at um, the New Testament and how the New Testament is written, we gain great insight into this. We see those apostles, right? We see their writings and those that were chosen as prophets. We see Jude, we see James, we see Peter, we see Paul, we see the unnamed Hebrew writer, but I think it was a collective effort with the apostles mainly Paul heading that up. You see that at the end of Hebrews when he talks about his relationship with Timothy. It, it's glaring to me. But we see there that these individuals chosen by God to deliver, they also carried along with them these signs that God was working through them. And we see that in their lives. And it's profound and powerful in the roles that they serve. And therefore, they became those that we need to live in obedience to the words that God had given them. We get to the Gospels, we see Matthew and John, these two being eyewitnesses, apostles chosen by Jesus. Uh, but then we get Mark and Luke, which is different because these two were not um, uh, apostles, but yet they were recording the eyewitness experiences with Jesus. So here we get uh, two different real narratives. One, you get direct contact through prophecy, with God through the apostles and those like James and Jude, and we get the word of God. But then we get the, the uh, examples of those that experience God and the outcomes of the way of that life in Mark and Luke. So, man, you get such a broad perspective of the word of God and how it was delivered in the New Testament. And it's powerful. It's profound. It, it's, it's stirring in every way. When we get here with Moses, we see such a beginning of that, that, prof, that prophet that Moses was, direct contact with God, giving God giving him direction. But then we also see the experiences uh, of those that um, adhered to the word of God and those that didn't. And it gives us valuable lessons uh, 
Because in these experiences, they themselves that are experiencing God or uh, we're seeing the outcome of the way of their life, whether they adhere to God's word or not, they're not verbatim giving us God's word, but we're getting the impression of God's word on their lives and the effect of it. And so we learn. So, you know, a lot of times people say, well, you know, you believe that's the word of God. Well, yeah, but what do they mean when they ask that question? Is it verbatim from God? And we see those instances with Moses sinning. Is it the experiences that we see or the imagery, right? They're very powerful narratives to understand God's word because the one who responds to God like Sennacherib, which sets negative venom against God, obviously Sennacherib is not speaking the word of God as he is speaking and what he has said is being recorded. That's not necessarily the word of God, but we see the impression of the word of God on an individual's life, the outcome of the way of rejecting God's word. Very powerful. So that that's a healthy way to understand, you know, God's word. It's, it's just a thought as we jump into Exodus chapter 35. This is why we don't get through much. <laughs> so Exodus chapter 35, beginning in verse one, Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, so he pulled everyone together and listen to what he says. These are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. <clears throat> so now Moses is coming and what is he doing? He's not just giving the impression <clears throat> or giving the outcome of the way of life in his life. He's saying, no, these are the things that God has commanded you to do. God's writings, God's word, uh, these are commands. <clears throat> these are not suggestions. These are not good ideas. These are commands. It's, uh, it's so ironic um, that when Jesus leaves the earth, what does he say to the apostles? <clears throat> He says, go make disciples, Matthew 28, verses 18 and following, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> and then watch what he says. And teaching them to obey everything I what commanded you. This is very powerful. Jesus, first, when he steps on the scene, he says, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. That's Matthew chapter 28. And he says, I want you to go do something. And he wants the apostles to go find individuals to follow Jesus. To And, and, and notice what he says, teach them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus uses the same phraseology that Moses appoints to God, obey his commands. Jesus says, I have commands. And he says it in the context of all authority has been given to me, where? In two places, in heaven and on earth. Wow, very powerful where Jesus is putting himself in this place of divinity. It's, you, you can't deny it. You don't go around saying, I have all authority in heaven and earth. Are you serious? <laughs> like, what, what are you, <laughs> huh? All authority. Do you understand? Um, there's but one God almighty. And this guy, Jesus says, I have all authority in heaven and earth. He didn't say just earth. He didn't say in the he in heaven and on earth, the same phraseology he uses your will be done in the prayer in Luke 11 on heaven in on earth as it is in heaven. Wow. And Jesus says the same thing that Moses comes down. I'm giving you commands. And now I want you to turn around and teach people to be in compliance, to obey everything. So one of the things that we see in Exodus 35 here is the thank you, Sass, is the foreshadowing of Jesus coming with all authority, calling people to obedience. We are called to 
obedience. I think this is something that is so easily lost in um, a hyper experience approach <laughs> to God. We want to experience joy. We want to experience happiness and, and a euphoric feeling, which I get. Um, but at the same time, we have to understand God expects obedience from us. We are called to be obedient. And, and you can't run from that. Sometimes we hide behind, well, God is gracious, God is forgiving, God is merciful. And, and, and we run from God's expectation of being obedient. And, 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 and we can't do that. And we get such vivid examples of those that were not obedient in the Old Testament and the consequences of that. And the consequences of not being obedient is death. But not only that, this, this is God showing you the consequence of, of rejecting God and not being obedient to God is a spiritual death. You follow me on that? It's very, very important. So when you read this, Moses gathers the whole Israelite community and he says to them in verse 1, these are the things the Lord has commanded you to do. So he lays out all of them, but then he starts here. For six days, work is to be done. But the seventh day shall be your holy day, a different day, a day of Sabbath rest. In other words, cease, a ceasing, a rest to whom? To the Lord. Now, watch what he puts on this command. He says, whoever does any work, on it is to be put to death. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day. So he's very clear in his direction. He's very specific about what this is. Well, what is it? It's a Sabbath day's rest. And how does the Sabbath work? It began on the eve, evening of Friday, through the evening on Saturday. That was the Sabbath day's rest. And what is this? It's a rest. Why? Why? You know, so often I get questions about the Sabbath. And is it binding upon us today? And what people mean by that is, if we don't celebrate the Sabbath, are we violating God's commands? Is it wrong to not celebrate the Sabbath? Or is it wrong to celebrate the Sabbath? <laughs> and, and so I'll say no to both of those. <laughs> uh, both of those questions. What am I getting at? Can you celebrate the Sabbath? Absolutely. Is there anything wrong with celebrating the Sabbath? Absolutely not. Is the Sabbath binding? In other words, if you don't do it, have you violated God? Well, you know, people ask questions like that all the time, and I don't want to give you my answer. I want to give you the Bible's answer. And, um, and what does the Bible actually say about the Sabbath? Well, the, the, the most educated individual in the New Testament that we know of about um, the history and the teaching of the Old Testament is the Apostle Paul. He is by far the most scholarly individual that writes in the New Testament with regards to the Old Testament law. He was a Pharisee. He was like a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was trained by Gamaliel. Gamaliel is one of the foremost scholars in the first century. His grandfather was Hillel. Hillel was one of the two, one of two premier scholars in the first century. Hillel and Shammai, they both had schools of thought, and these were two uh, incredibly brilliant uh, teachers of the Old Testament law. Well, Gamaliel was Hillel's grandson, and Gamaliel trained the Apostle Paul. Paul was a Pharisee. He speaks of himself as 
phenomenally educated and his life in the teaching of as a Pharisee was flawless as he describes himself. And, and so, so if you want to talk about, well, who is uh, uh, possibly uh, the best uh, in giving us uh, an understanding of the Sabbath and its place in the New Testament, you have to read Paul. So let's go to Colossians chapter 2. Because I want to give you, one, just a biblical understanding of the Sabbath in the New Testament, and this is a scholar speaking of it, one who is well-versed with everything we've read in the Old Testament pertaining to Moses, the law, and the Sabbath. So he is, he is the guy that knows this inside and out, and he's going to give us the answer that we're looking for. And the answer that he gives is all um, grounded in the uh, supremacy of Christ, in the lordship of Christ. So we're going to pick up uh, in Colossians chapter 2, verse 6. Now, you got to understand the context. The context here is Christ and his supremacy. Who is this Christ and how it affects us as it pertains to everything that the world has to offer, both worldly philosophy and teaching, but also teaching as it pertains to the Levitical law. Very powerful. That's the context, and it addresses circumcision, it addresses the Sabbath, and it addresses the law. The Sabbath and circumcision all predate the law, and Paul addresses it here with the supremacy of Christ. So let's get into Colossians chapter 2, verse 6, to answer the question, is the Sabbath binding? All right, verse 6, so then, so Paul's writing, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, continue to live your lives in him. So what is he getting at? This is the context, the supremacy of Christ the Lordship of Christ. And notice what he says, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord. Lord is the term that they used in the Old Testament to, to speak of God without using his name because his name was holy and sacred. So here it is. He says, you received Jesus now as Lord, Master. He is Lord of your life. What does he say? Continue to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in your faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. So what's his attention? What is he saying? Give ourselves to the Lordship of Christ. Now, how does that apply when I give myself to the Lordship of Christ? What does that mean functionally in the world that we live in? Well, he addresses a couple of areas. Verse 8, See to it that what? No one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. So one of the things is hollow and deceptive philosophy. The Lordship of Christ ranks over and above that. Worldly philosophy, hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on what? Now watch this. Human tradition and elementary spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Well, he gets into... Um, two areas here, human tradition. I mean, that falls right into what's happening with the Pharisaical teaching, because Jesus says that, and we read in Mark, uh, Mark chapter 16, what does he say? Your teachings are but rules taught by men, as he's speaking of the Pharisees. Paul is emanating that. What does he say? It depends on human tradition and elementary spiritual forces of this world rather than on Christ. Wow. Why is he saying elemental spiritual forces? Because angels introduced the law. The law was introduced by angels. We read that in Galatians. That's, that's what it is. Hebrew writer makes that clear, that the law was introduced by angels. They're elemental spiritual forces. They are not the supremacy of Christ. Well, why does he, how do we know that? Look at verse nine. For in Christ, what? All the fullness of deity lives in bodily form. So what do you see? The supremacy of Christ 
over the elementary or spiritual forces of this world, over angels, over anything in this world, we have the supremacy of Christ. Why? The fullness of deity lives in bodily form. The fullness of God lives in Christ. And guess what? And in Christ, you have been brought to what? Fullness. Wow. Fullness. Do you understand? What is he getting at? The supremacy of Christ, the lordship of Christ is over and above everything. So he says, you've been given fullness. Watch this. He is the head. Uh, oh, thank you. Thank you uh, for the swan. He said, watch what he says. He is the head over what? Every power and every authority. Do you understand what, what's happening here? So what is he trying to help us to understand? Anything that um, is giving a direction, uh, anything uh, that is of any kind of authority is what? Under the authority of Christ. Uh, that, that's, that's what the scriptures say. Now, again, what am I addressing? I am addressing this idea from a scholar of the Old Testament. What is his view on the Sabbath and the where what place it has? And he's giving us the context through which we make all decisions. Christ is what? Over every power and authority. It didn't say most. It's oh, he is it. He's full, he has the fullness of God. Verse 11, in him. Now, he addresses one of the uh, pertinent issues in the first century, the binding of circumcision. Circumcision, we know, predates the law. Abraham was the first to introduce circumcision. And what are we finding? That in the first century, there was a lot of folks that felt like you must be circumcised in order to be saved. There is no salvation without obedience, compliance to the command of God to be circumcised. That, that's, that's, that's what was going on. And so people were feeling just as much about circumcision as they were about the Sabbath, that you, it's binding. But watch what Paul does here. He, notice what he says. In him, you were also circumcised. Now watch what he does with a circumcision not performed by human hands. So he is saying the circumcision you received is far superior than that of human hands. Very powerful. Why? Because this was something that people were holding on to as binding, saying that if you are not circumcised, there is no way you're going to make it to heaven. No different than what they were doing with the Sabbath. No different than what people sometimes today uh, say about the Sabbath. They make it bind. Well, watch what he does. In him, you were also circumcised with the circumcision not performed by human hands. Now, and then he even compares. He says, one, it was a spiritual one. But two, guess what? He says, you were circumcised by Christ. Well, how? Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off not just a small section of your body. You know, with circumcision, obviously it's a small, <laughs> this is a weird conversation. You get what I'm getting at, right? Um, but the other part of this that is that people don't think about, women were not circumcised. So in Christ, not only the whole self is circumcised, but women are circumcised. Their whole self, which was ruled by the flesh, was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. So he's saying, this is so superior. Why? Because of the Lordship of Christ. Right? Powerful, right? And then what does he say? Heaven, but how was that taking place? Well, verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism. This is where circumcision takes place. It happens in baptism. You can't just throw off baptism because you don't like it, because you think it's some kind of ceremonial tradition or some kind of symbolic thing. Paul does not say that. Paul says, this is where it takes place. 
in baptism, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him. How were you raised with him? The water? No, you were raised with him through your faith in the work of baptism? No, in the working of God. God is working in baptism through your faith. That's where the work is on God. It's not on you who raised him from the dead. Now watch this, verse 13. When you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, so Paul is giving credibility to the death that is asserted to those who are not circumcised. So, you know, what they were feeling is true. If you're not circumcised, you can't make it. Well, Paul is saying, here's how Christ circumcised you. You can make it. And notice what he says. In your uncircumcised flesh, God made you alive with Christ. Well, how? He forgave us our sins. This is Acts 2.38. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for what? The forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, how did he forgive us? He canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away. Well, how has God taken it away? He nailed it to the cross. He nailed it to the cross. Having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. So what is he getting at here? That the victory now is in Christ. The victory is not in circumcision. It's not in the law. The victory is not in the former prophets. The victory is all in Christ. Christ supersedes all that has come. And he starts off with circumcision. Now watch what he does in verse 16. So he starts with circumcision. Why? Because that was the first covenant promise. That was the first instituted event that they had to obey in circumcision. But then watch where he goes. Therefore, listen, in light of this, therefore, because of what Christ has done, therefore, here's what I want you to understand. Do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regards to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. Do you hear him? Listen to him. He now lumps all that there is in the Tanakh with regards to what? Food, drink, religious festivals, new moon celebrations, and a Sabbath. <laughs> what does he say? Don't let anyone judge you. Why is he putting it in this context? Because people were trying to make these items binding in order to go to heaven. And Paul says, don't let anyone judge you. Some would say, oh, well, what he's saying is, don't let them judge you because you participate in them. No, he's not. First of all, the context is not saying that. But watch what he says in verse 17. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. So it's clear. It is so clear that these things were just a foreshadowing. They were all speaking of who? Christ. Christ. So in Christ, we are set free from all that. Now watch what he says. Verse 17, these are a shadow of the things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let, now watch verse 18. Do not let anyone who delights in false humility, he calls it false humility, those that are delighting in all those Sabbath things because it comes across as being humble, vulnerable, surrendered to God. He calls it false humility. That's what he's calling it. it, it can't, you can't deny it. Who delights in false humility. And then watch what he says. And they worship of angels. Why is he saying the worship of angels? Because angels instituted the law. He says they are worshiping angels. They are putting their uh, 
severe, uh, sincere devotion into what? The worship of angels. And notice what he says. Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen, and they're puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. This He calls them unspiritual. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to what? To the elemental spiritual forces of this world. Why, as though you still belong to this world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which had to do with mere human commands and teachings. So you see what he's getting at here? He's like, look, this stuff was, uh, it had its place, but Christ far supersedes. What was its place? It was a foreshadowing of Christ. Uh, and, and I mean, what do you do? This is the truth. I get it. People get offended by this. People don't like this. People uh, sometimes they get angry with this. I I, I can't listen. I, I don't have a uh, a place to justify false teaching. I I I just don't. <laughs> uh, you know, it it this is just what Paul, who was a scholar of the Old Testament understood in the New Testament its application under Christ. He was a scholar. You know, when people want to sit there and argue over this, they think they're arguing with me. They think they're arguing with people. I, no, you're arguing with the Apostle Paul, who was a scholar. I think he's well, much better versed in the Old Testament than anybody I've met in this world. Not only is he a scholar of it, Jesus specifically tasked him to preach the gospel message to Gentiles so that they could be saved. He felt Jesus was like, this is my guy to help the Gentile community become Christians. Now, why did he use him? Well, one, he came from a lineage of teaching through Gamaliel that believed Gentiles could be saved in Judaism, that they could convert. Some didn't believe that. But the other part of this is, if he's going to bring in the boatload of Gentiles, the Jewish Christians, Jesus knew that this guy's going to bring in a bunch of Gentiles. He better be well-versed in the Old Testament scriptures, because the Jewish Christians are going to have a serious problem with Gentiles becoming Christians and not adhering to the law. So God had to use someone who was sensitive and had compassion for the Gentile community to be saved, but also had to be a scholar of the Old Testament because the merging of Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians was going to be very tricky, and you need a master, a PhD, individual of the Old Testament to rightly navigate that. And God found him in Paul. And hence we get Colossians chapter 2. And Paul's emphasis on this, why it's not binding, is because we're now bound under the Lordship of Jesus. Amen? <laughs> I hope this was helpful when we look at the, the idea of the Sabbath being binding or any of the festivals that we're going to be reading through in Exodus, I hope this really helps you. Thank you, Linda. Thank you for the roses. I hope this gives you a healthy perspective. And again, it's not my opinion. I'm not, um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, say, oh, this is my opinion or my understanding of this. I'm just reading. I, I, it, it, it's just, just read it. Just, just read what he says. It's all right there. And it's powerful. And I get it. Um, there are things that um, people misconstrued. 
but this is the scriptures. Hey, listen, if you're just joining with us this morning, I want to welcome you. This is what we do every morning, 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, we get into the word of God and, and we go methodically through scriptures and it takes us forever to work through a particular chapter. Today, we just started uh, Exodus chapter 35. I think we only read like three or four verses. Well, why? We're taking our time. We're in no rush. We ain't got nowhere to go. We just want to learn God's word. We want to learn God's word. We want to understand God's word. And a lot of times what happens is that we have to cross reference to get better context. But if you like what you hear, what you're hearing this morning, and you just joined us and you like it, do me a favor. Encourage me because I need encouragement. Why? Well, I've been doing this. It'll be a year at the end of this month. I mean, next week will be a year. Every day at 7 a.m. for a year, pretty much. There's a couple of days I miss for vacation or sick or something like that. I bring this. And, and let me tell you, you clicking the follow encourages me. It really does. It helps me to go, hey, Chip, guess what? There are people out there that like this content. So when I see that, it inspires me, well, Chip, keep doing it. Because if people don't like the content, and they're not showing up, then I'm not inspired to show up. But when you click the follow, it encourages me. Thank you, Billy Joe. Thank you. Thank you. It inspires me to keep doing it. It, it. it lets me know, hey, Chip, there are people out there that really like this. Oh, thank you, Patience All Day. I appreciate that. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. I so appreciate it. What's happening, Craig? How you doing? It, it encourages me. It lets me know, Chip, there are people out there that like this content, keep bringing this content. And so I, that's that's what gets me up. And I'm up every morning uh, and I'm preparing myself to be able to uh, present to you the word of God. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate the, the, the encouraging words. They help me out. That helps me. Thank you, Kim. Thanks so much for the swan, the gifts, the likes. I mean, we get so many likes every day. I don't know. We get anywhere from 15 to 20 some thousand every day. Thank David for that. He's the pioneer of the likes. His thumbs are probably the strongest thumbs in the nation. <laughs> but I tell you, it it it's um... <laughs> Mr. Clee. <laughs> That's a good one. <laughs> so. All right, so let's get back to Exodus. So you guys got that in Colossians chapter two. Uh, all right, so let's get back to Exodus 35. You know, Moses introduces this idea of rest, right? He's like, look, you know, the Lord, he worked for six days and then uh, on the seventh, he rested. Well, I want to talk, talk about the Sabbath a little bit different Um the idea that we need rest. Now, mind you, I, what I just said is that it's not binding, uh, right? That that this is not a salvation issue. But I do believe that there's something right about a well-being issue, that we all need uh, rest. Uh, Jesus even needed rest. Look in John chapter 4, verse 6. Jesus meeting the woman at the well, the Samaritan woman. What does it say in John 4, 6? It says, Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as uh, he was from the journey, sat down by the well. You know, the bottom line is that physically, we do get tired. Uh, Jesus got tired. I don't think we think about that too often. Jesus gets tired. We need rest. Mark chapter 4, verse 38. They're in the boat. Jesus is in the stern. And what does it say in verse 38? Jesus was in the stern sleeping on a cushion. The disciples woke him and said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Now, Jesus is really tired because they're in a storm and he's not awake. He is knocked out. I mean, knocked. I mean, Jesus is snoring. Maybe even got a little drool going on. I don't know. But, you know, our bodies fatigue. Our bodies need rest. And that God understands that for us. In Mark chapter 6, verse 31, 
It says, then, because so many people were coming and going that they did not even have a chance to eat, Jesus said to them, come with me by yourselves, now watch this, to a quiet place and get some rest. There is something about rest. You need rest. God is making that clear with the Sabbath. I, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with participating in a Sabbath rest. That, that there's, there's good in that. It does not make you righteous, and it does not make you unrighteous. It does not make you super spiritual or super unspiritual, whether you participate in it or not. But it does have something to do with your own well-being, you know, finding a quiet place to rest. You know, uh, a lot of times at night, I I go out and ride my bike. Now, I have an electric bike, so it's not like I'm working out. <laughs> and I And I love in the summer, in particular, at night when it's just the breeze is right, the weather is spectacular, the sky or the moon, like last night was a full moon. It was just gorgeous. And I just go out and um, and I ride up and down the streets and there's a, a bench in one of the towns next to me. And I go and I just sit there and I look to the sky and, and boy, and just sit and do nothing. Just sit sometimes. I, there's something about that. And when you think about a Sabbath rest, you know, doing from the eve of Friday to the evening of Sunday, doing nothing, just resting, finding that center, there, there's, there's just good in that. But it doesn't make you super righteous and it doesn't make you super unrighteous. It, it, but God, it helps us with our well-being. Jesus even says to the disciples, Come with me, and notice what he says, to a quiet place. Jesus puts on here a quiet place so that you can gain some rest. Luke chapter 9, verse 58. It's an interesting statement that Jesus makes. He replies, as someone was thinking of following him, what does he say? He says, foxes have dens and birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. It was on his mind to find a place of rest. This is a good thing. Don't think that you've got to allow the busyness of life to ruin an opportunity for you to find rest. That's a good thing. God wants it. Uh, we read in the scriptures, Psalms 23, Notice what it says in verse two. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. You know, there's a refreshment that comes when we allow God to lead us to quiet waters. A refreshment. That that this is a good thing. This is this is not a bad thing. We all need it. And the thing about it is. We don't think we need it until we get it. Why? Because there's always uh, something chasing us, right? There's always something that's trying to uh, get our attention. There's always something that is um, forcing us to give our energy and our effort and our emotional uh, uh, energy to it, right? Uh, and that's where we, we've got to, Look at what he says here. The psalmist writes in verse two, he makes me lie down. <laughs> you got to love that. He makes me lie down. You know, we, we got to be forced. And notice what he says. He refreshes my soul. God wants you to be refreshed. So it, it's a good thing. Um uh, Proverbs 17, verse 1, it says, better a dry crust with peace and quiet than a house full of uh, feasting with strife. I mean, listen to the, <laughs> the writer. It's like, better a dry crust with peace and quiet. Peace and quiet is a good thing than a house full of festing, 
uh, uh, feasting and strife, right? Because what happens? Strife, relationship, woes, uh, conflict, all these things push out rest. All these things uh, make things so contentious. It, 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 it just, we need peace and we need quiet. This is why God commanded the people to rest. You, you, you've got to do that. If you don't do that, what happens? One thing stacks on to another thing that stacks on to another thing. And, and pretty soon, then you wind up blowing, blowing up, right? When you don't get the rest and reflective time necessary. Psalms 4, verse 8, in peace, I will lay down and sleep. For you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. What is what is the writer getting at? You know how you can't sleep at night? You know, things just, that your mind is racing, right? And 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 what is it? It's because you haven't found peace. You, 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 there's strife, there's stress in our life. And that's uh, Psalms 4, verse 8. Psalms 4, verse 8. And, and, and so... That's why God is saying, rest, take a Sabbath, get, get, find that peace so that you can lie down and sleep uh, for the Lord, Lord alone, um, how's that, right? It's, it's, it's a good thing. It renews your strength. You know, um, you want your strength, Lamentations chapter five, verse five, those who pursue us are at our heels. We are weary and find no rest. We we need rest because when you're when you don't find rest, you are weary. You are weary. And there, you know, I love what he writes here. Those that pursue us, uh, they're on our heels. It's it's always something coming after you, right? The next bill, the next job, getting fired, no money, sickness, help. You name it. all these things are racing after us, and and, and we grow weary because we find no rest. You, you you have to rejuvenate yourself in getting rest. You, you follow me with this? So what God is instituting here uh, is a good thing. It's a it's a good thing for our well being, not a binding thing, but a good thing. So when you go back to Exodus chapter thirty five and verse one, Moses assembled the whole Israelite community and said to them, "These are the things that the Lord has commanded you to do: for six days work is to be done, but the seventh day shall be your holy day, a day of Sabbath rest to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it will be put to death. Do not light a fire in any of your dwellings on the Sabbath day." Now, what is God getting at here? You need to be rested and you need to rest so that you do not grow weary. Well, why does he put a death penalty on it? Well, one, God expects obedience in anything. He expects it. Number two, God has an intended purpose with the Israelite community. They're going to bring salvation through the seed of Abraham in Jesus to all of mankind. Without that coming, nothing, no one will be saved. And so anything that would violate that must be put to death. And hence we get God's command. If you do not do these things, you will be put to death. Amen. <laughs> that, my friend, is Exodus chapter 35. I mean, and we got through three verses. <laughs> <laughs> hey if you like what you heard like and subscribe we're here every morning 7 a.m eastern standard time we have a great time getting into god's word i hope this has been inspiring helpful clearing up some things with you i hope that you're uh moved by what we've studied this morning let our hearts be humble before god that we bring honor to god reflect on these matters pray on these matters go back and look at the scriptures that we looked on these things and I believe God will give you insight into all of this. Thank you for being with me.